Y'all thought I was going to run from the back, didn't you? <laughs> Jog up the stairs, do a little dance. No, I'm not going to do that. And guess what else? Um, this song doesn't have anything to do with my presentation, so I just thought I'd clue you in about that. I chose it, though, because I think we often need um, songs that um, take us through those you can do this moment. And so I'm having one of those, so I'm going to do this for y'all. And I'm going to tell you a story about a journey um, that I've been on and several of my colleagues at Sheltering Arms um, have been on over the last several years. And it really is a learning journey um, on many accounts. And before I get into all of that, what I do um, want to do is share some information that will provide some context to this story. First of all, I have um, worked in the field of aging and gerontology my entire career. So that means over 40 years, um, I've had lots of different jobs and lots of different responsibilities, but all of them in one way or another had to do with serving older adults. When my kids were little, they would say, you know, what do you do for a living? And it would get very complicated to explain that to them. So finally I just said, I worry about old people. That's what I do. I worry about old people and I go to meetings. That's what I do. <laughs> I think of myself um, as a very honest, direct, straight shooter kind of person. And I think the people uh, that know me would agree with that. Um, my daughter would add the word blunt. My previous supervisor, my previous boss, a woman by the name of Angela Blanchard, who I think many of you might know, was also very quick to tell people, yes, Jane's our regional expert in aging. She is also a pain in the ass. <laughs> and that's, that was OK, but she was a little frequent about telling people that. <laughs> the other part of this, this um, informa other information I wanted to share to provide some context for you is really about the organization itself. So for um, 120 years, Sheltering Arms Senior Services was a standalone 501c3 nonprofit agency in Houston, Texas. And for all of those 120 years, that agency was dedicated solely to providing services that promoted the dignity and independence of older adults. In 2010, the agency experienced a significant underscore significant financial meltdown, and we ended up merging with Baker Ripley, which was then Neighborhood Centers. And I call it a merger, but it really was an acquisition, don't let them fool you. And the truth is, we didn't really care what they called it. We were grateful. We were grateful for the opportunity to continue the work. We were grateful that somebody believed in us enough to keep us going. But make no mistake about it, mergers are hard. And they're hard for everyone. This turned out to be a very good thing. Don't get me wrong about that either. But that didn't mean there weren't shifts and adjustments that we had to make throughout that process that we never anticipated. So we move on. We go into the, we go into the merger. And um, six months in, my boss comes and says, I want you to do a presentation to the board. They need to understand sheltering arms better. They need to understand aging better. They need to understand the issues and the trends in the field better. You got 20 minutes on the agenda of the upcoming board meeting. I'm like, all right, I can do this. I don't need a song for this. I got this. <laughs> Done this before, talked about it 100 times, believe in it fully. And I was excited. I was excited about the opportunity to educate. I was really excited about the opportunity to lift up the division. And I was really, really glad to have a chance to publicly thank the board and the executive team of Baker Ripley for believing in us and for taking us on. That was, took courage, and we were deeply grateful for that. So the day of the board meeting comes. I'm all excited. I got my slides together. I got my talking points together. And I start out, as we almost always do in the field of aging, by the way, if you've ever heard somebody in, the, in that space give a presentation, we almost always start out talking about the demographics and the unprecedented growth in the um, older adult population. And um, also, like we very often do in aging, I likened it to a wave, a big wave, a tsunami. And I talked about it almost like a warning. Like, look out, they're coming, get prepared. <laughs> and um, 
The truth was, tens of thousands of people over the age of 65 are headed our way. And with them, ladies and gentlemen, with them, they will bring, excuse the expression, a boatload of problems. So I then proceeded to provide what I believe to be very compelling statistics about these problems. I talked about the fact that more than half of the people over the age of 65 suffer with at least two chronic illnesses. I let that board know that if they were lucky enough to live to the age of 85, and most of them would, they stood about a 50-50 chance of having Alzheimer's disease. And then I wrapped it up with some very unsettling statistics about the prevalence of anxiety and depression, <laughs> loneliness and isolation in older adults. So by the time I was done, I had done a fabulous job, people, of painting a picture of our clients that looked like that. Helpless, hopeless, and in need of more services and supports than we could ever begin to provide. Now, I will just pause for one second here to say, this might not be the best approach to getting your board fired up and glad you're part of their family now. <laughs> but I didn't care. I did not care. You know why? Because I told it like it was, because I was a straight shooter kind of person. So after the board meeting, my boss comes to me and she goes, you know, we don't talk about our clients like that here. We don't think about our clients like that here. I was like, really? Well, how do you think about them? Well, how do you talk about them? Well, you know, we talk about their strengths. We talk about their assets. We talk about the contributions that they want to make. Um, we talk about their goals and their aspirations. And I'm like, really? I'm talking about people in their 70s, 80s, pushing 90. I'm pretty sure they don't have goals. And I'm damn sure they don't have aspirations. But, new boss, I'll go with you on this. How do you get at that? How do you know what their strengths are, their aspirations are, their goals are? She goes, well, we use a process called appreciative inquiry. And that means we don't ask the kinds of questions that you ask in a typical needs assessment. We don't ask what's wrong. We don't ask what their greatest challenge is. We don't ask what's not working. We actually ask what is working. What's important to you? What is it that you want to do? What skills and talents do you have? So she says, I need you to use appreciative inquiry and tell a new story about seniors. I kid you not, folks, I'm like, oh my god. Did she really say that to me out loud? Like, I have to go do this now? Because, see, I had heard of appreciative inquiry. I had been to conference sessions just like at this, uh, at this conference. I had learned all about it. I had heard all the rhetoric about how it builds on strengths and it leverages assets. <laughs> and I was convinced it was nothing much more than spin. But uh, let me remind you, new boss, new organization, kind of sort of needed my job. I said, OK, we'll do this. We'll use appreciative inquiry, and we'll talk to, we'll talk to older people. And we did. So staff and volunteers interviewed about 70 um, older people. And we didn't ask them um, the traditional questions of what's not working, what's, um, you know, what's your greatest challenge, what's horrible about being 85 years old. We asked them, actually, what's great about being 85 years old? We asked them what brought them joy in their lives. We asked them what they had left to do that they still wanted to do. And I will tell you, skeptic or not, I will tell you that the responses we heard were not only amazing, they were truly inspirational. So we had done a pretty good job of finding older adults that kind of mirrored the demographics of the older people in our community. So nice, nice mix of socioeconomic level, nice mix of gender, age, um, ethnicity. And, and we asked them these questions. And far and away, this is how the people that we interviewed described this time of their lives. Freedom, freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want. Freedom to do the things I never got to do before when I was busy raising my family, busy in my career. I thought, wow, I might like a little of that. They also told us that what was absolutely the most important to them and the thing that brought them the greatest joy was having the opportunity to help somebody else. Didn't have to be in a formal setting didn't have to be um, in some like, kind of volunteer program. It could have been family, helping out family. It was having purpose 
and having the opportunity to give. And that was important to people. We also heard them loudly and clearly talk about the most um, thing that they valued most was being engaged in meaningful relationships. And we heard from Angie earlier how important that is. It starts way back in the importance of relationship lingers. And then across the board, regardless of circumstance, regardless of demographic, what we heard from nearly every single older person that we talked to was the, their understanding of the need and the desire to stay physically active. So we get done with this, I'm like, damn, didn't see that coming. Now what am I gonna do? Because I had a really nice solid program for very frail, helpless old people. Um, so you might ask me too, too like, Jane, this is fascinating. So what? So what? What difference did it make? Did you do anything differently with your clients? Did you provide services any differently? And the, the short answer to that is yes. Today, we provide the same services to older people that we did at the time of the merger. However, today, every single one of those programs also includes an opportunity for those clients to contribute and give back to their communities. Every single one of those programs also includes some element of physical activity or wellness, and every one of those programs strives to create opportunity for those clients to engage in a meaningful relationship. So yeah, it made a difference, and we're doing things differently. Let me be clear, appreciative inquiry is not magic. It is a process, is it an approach? It doesn't mean that we pretend there are no problems. What it does is it gives you opportunity to discover the solutions in a new and different way. So I really do encourage you to, um, to uh, check it out and to give it a shot. The other beauty of appreciative inquiry, I will just say quickly, is that it can be applied to any number of settings and, in any number of, for, and for any number of purposes. Baker Ripley uses appreciative inquiry exclusively in its neighborhood transformation work. We also use it to design new programs. We also use it to create quality improvement plans for existing programs. And we've even used it to, um, to address some uh, staff morale issues. So it is really quite encompassing. And again, I encourage you to, um, to check it out. So it's been a fascinating journey these past seven years. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I am grateful for that. So the three things, three most important things that I learned, and the things that I hope that you will remember, if you don't remember anything else about this presentation, is number one, it's okay to try something new. Number two, it's okay to admit you're wrong. And number three, it's okay to grow old. Thank you all very much.